My name is Neil Mahapatra. I am a co-founder and executive chairman of Oxford Cannabinoid Technologies, OCT. And also on the webinar today with me is Dr. John Lucas, the CEO of the business who you will be hearing from shortly. Uh, this is our investor presentation, which we are very lucky to take you through tonight. So just beginning with the, um, the first page, the, uh, the summary page, um, that's a, a snapshot of, of who we are and, and of the investment opportunity. We are a next generation cannabis company that is developing cannabinoid and cannabis based medicines for the over 40 billion pound pain market. We recently raised 16 and a half million at IPO um, and we think of ourselves as the next GW pharmaceuticals and there's a slide uh, very shortly after this that talks about why we think of ourselves as the next GW. GW, I'm sure you know, is a, is a company that was bought for um, over $7 billion by an American pharmaceutical company about three months ago. Um, we've raised 16 and a half million uh, at IPO to take four of our drug programs through uh, further in development and two of our lead programs into phase one clinical trials uh, through to the end of, end of phase one. Um, we have a, a really strong team led by John, and we're one of the unique cannabis companies in London in that we have a, a FTSE 100 uh, shareholder, Imperial Brands, already uh, in our shareholder base. And finally, just to finish on this slide, we have a, a series of world-class research partners, uh, in particular the University of Oxford, and there's a slide later on in the deck that talks about our, our relationship with them and, and how we developed it. Um, so just to move to the next slide, this slide explains why we're different from uh, many and the vast majority of medical cannabis firms uh, that are out there and why we think of ourselves as, as the next GW Pharmaceuticals. There were, there were two business models that we could have chosen when we set up OCT. The first is the unlicensed medicines business model, which is the, the vast majority of, of cannabis firms, really. Um, and, and the second is the licensed medicines business model, otherwise known as prescription medicines, the type of medicine that you pick up from your pharmacy once you've received a, a prescription from your doctor. Um, we feel that the unlicensed medicines route has a range of issues associated with it. There's a lack of standardization of dosage. No one batch of cannabis is, is the same. Uh, and there's a lack of standardization with regards to quality. Uh, and for those reasons and others, the, the medical community really struggles to get behind unlicensed medicines. The, the licensed medicines route, on the other hand, and is very different. And, and we take cannabis and, and cannabinoids and extract cannabinoids from, from cannabis, but we then use this product to pursue drug development through these already pre-existing channels of pharmaceutical, develop, pharmaceutical development, namely phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials that have been around for decades. And we firmly believe that it's only by developing drugs through those channels which the medical community understands that you can really build up the confidence of the medical community to prescribe cannabis-based products. Our doctors really struggle with unlicensed medicines and, the, and prescribing unlicensed medicines in, in volume. But if you've taken cannabis and walked through these existing channels of pharmaceutical development, that's how you get the support of the medical community behind you. The example of GW Pharma is a great example for this, where they have taken uh, cannabis oil that you could arguably buy um, under a different brand from Holland and Barrett and, and taken them through these existing channels of pharmaceutical development, phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. And now they're selling about half a billion dollars worth, billion dollars worth of cannabis oil per year. And that just shows you the value that can be achieved when you work with cannabis through these existing channels uh, of, of pharma development. It's an important point as to why we're different from most cannabis firms out there and why we think of ourselves as, as the next GW Pharma. Um, the next slide uh, talks about um, our, sort of where we've come from to date and, and um, what we are doing uh, post our listing. So we were founded in, in March 2017 after nearly one and a half years worth of discussions with Oxford University. Um, in 2018, we started developing our library of proprietary cannabinoid derivatives. And by that, we, we extracted cannabinoids from cannabis and we, we changed their structure slightly using medicinal chemistry techniques. And we did that because you can make them more effective, but we also did that so you can patent them. 
if something's a natural product and you don't change its form versus the form that is found in nature, you cannot put intellectual property composition and matter patents around them. But by changing the structure slightly, um, you can put IP and composition of matter patents around them. In other words, by creating this library of derivatives, we've created this library of future drug compounds um, that when they show um, interesting results in testing with our partners such as Oxford, we can very quickly patent. Um, in August 2018, we closed our first institutional round of capital with Imperial Brands uh, and Los Angeles based private equity firm Casa Verde Capital uh, and in September 2019 we in-licensed our lead drug development compound which John will talk about uh, shortly and, and why we think that's we've got real blockbuster potential um, for us. Uh, in April 2020 we were funded and uh, we were published in the respected scientific journal pain along with one of our Oxford research professors and now we've raised money at IPO we intend to progress our lead drug development programs through phase one clinical trials um, we will that will take up until the end of 2023 whereupon we will look to enter uh, phase two clinical trials with 46 12 by one and our second drug development program our library of of cannabinoid based derivatives and the team um, the team to get us there is, is on the next slide and it's um it's a really high quality team I feel very lucky and, and privileged to work with with all of them they're led by uh, Dr. John Lucas, who you'll hear from shortly, he's a, as well as being a trained molecular geneticist, he's also a qualified lawyer. And I think when you're working with cannabis uh, and cannabinoids, under, having an appreciation for the legal landscape in which you're operating is really important. Um, he's accompanied by Clarissa Suimimo Koka, who's our COO and, and general counsel. She works with John on company strategy also focuses a lot on internal management and as our general counsel is responsible for making sure our home office licenses are renewed every year as they need to be to handle cannabis and, and controlled substances. Karen Lowe is our experienced finance director, sat on the board for many UK PLCs, very well versed in um, all financial aspects of, of listed companies and Dr. Valentino Paravicini is our superstar chief scientific officer who has over 20 years experience in scientific research and over a decade in, in large cap pharma, nearly eight of which was, um, was at Glaxo. So it's a really high quality and institutional level team that we think will, will carry this company forward for the next decade along with a, a similarly institutional level Board. I won't spend too much time on the left hand side. I'm on the left and then uh, the, the team that I've just described is uh, is on the remainder of the left hand side. On the right hand side is my co-founder and, and fellow non-exec uh, Gavin Safianathan. Uh, and then Bish Mukherjee is the representative from Imperial Brands. And having um, a FTSE 100 on our shareholder base and on our board is really giving um, investors and counterparties comfort that we are a high quality cannabis company and very different um, from all of the rest. And finally, just to complete our uh, the rest of the board is Cheryl Dillon, our independent pharma non-exec um, who's had nearly three decades of experience working in pharma companies both in Asia and Europe. And Julie Pomeroy is our finance independent finance non-exec um, who has a, a range of experience sitting on uh, boards of UK PLC and as CFO uh, of many UK PLC so that's the board I won't spend any more time on this suffice to say I think there's a real diversity of, of experience which stands the company in really good stead for the next 10 years um, I'll hand over to John now who'll talk about the problem we're trying to solve um, how we're doing it and, and why that's a, a massive opportunity for us John Thanks, Neil. Uh, the problem is the lack of safe and effective drug products for treating chronic and severe pain. And this has led to the use and overuse of opioids for indications where they're not well suited. And this is why we're in the midst of an opioid crisis. 50% of the medical cannabis market is directed to pain or a painful condition. And that tells us that cannabinoids are safe and effective at treating pain. The pie chart in the bottom right shows the total addressable market for cannabinoids and it's broken down into the types of pain that cannabinoids can treat. This adds up to an over 40 billion market that's growing rapidly. Now, one of the problems with medical cannabis is that doctors in the US can't prescribe it by law and they're reluctant to recommend it. In the UK, some specialists can prescribe medical cannabis in limited situations, but again, they're reluctant to do so and for good reason. Medical cannabis unlicensed medical cannabis 
shifts the burden that would normally be the responsibility of a medicine's regulatory agency like FDA and MHRA to the physician. Physicians must take on the responsibility that the unapproved product is both safe and effective and produced in a quality and dose consistent manner. Understandably, most physicians are unwilling to take on this burden. This is what medical cannabis is up against, and it's what OCT is using to our advantage. See, we're pushing on an open door. The regulatory agencies fully support our approach. For example, the FDA stated publicly that it is critical that the FDA continues to do what we can to support the science needed to develop new drugs from cannabis. So the opportunity lies before us. And if you believe that cannabinoids are safe and effective at treating pain, then all we have to do at OCT is show it. And we'll show it using randomized controlled clinical trials. Why? <clears throat> because randomized controlled clinical trials is the only definitive way of demonstrating the drug product is both safe and effective. And it's the only path supported by FDA and other regulatory agencies. And without these trials, FDA is not going to approve a drug product. And without FDA approval, a physician can't prescribe it. And without FDA approval, the drug's not going to be reimbursed. So the key here if our OCT is this three-way relationship uh, with the, between the, uh, the doctor, the patient, and the insurer. And OCT is going to be a part of this by providing assurance to the doctor that the drug products are both safe and effective and relief to the patient relief in the form of pain relief, and financial relief in the form of reimbursement by insurers. We developed three types of compounds at OCT. The first are natural phytocannabinoids. The advantage here, safe and effective, long history of use. The disadvantage is lack of patent protection. However, and this is a very important point, unlike medical cannabis, we can obtain market exclusivity by pursuing orphan indications. This is the same approach adopted by GW and other pharmaceutical companies. There's over 6,000 orphan indications, and in return for developing a new medicine for one of these indications, the FDA grants the drug maker seven years of market exclusivity, and in Europe and Japan, it's 10 years. A second type of compound is where we chemically modify a natural phytocannabinoid to improve its uh, drug-like characteristics, and this is what we call a cannabinoid derivative. <clears throat> And finally, the third type of compound is a cannabinoid mimetic. Uh, this compound acts like a, a highly potent and selective cannabinoid, although it has a very different chemical structure. We also in-license compounds falling into one of those three categories. And in-license allows us to advance our pipeline faster because they start in a further uh, state of development, stage in development. Now, when we formed OCT, we decided to use a virtual model to save on both cost and time to build out. We have several partners, both academic and commercial. The choice of partner depends on the type and stage of research and development. And importantly, OCT owns all rights to IP arising out of research uh, and development for many of our partners. Now turning to the bottom of the slide, the monetization of our programs, each time we successfully pass a stage in development, we decrease our risk and increase the value of the program. And the increases in value along these value inflection points, they're nonlinear, but the greatest fold increase is seen in later stage in development. Now, our goal is to directly, directly commercialize our drug products. However, by reaching the later stage value inflection points, we also position the company for an acquisition or high value partnership. I'd like to turn it over to now and now to Neil to discuss our relationship with Oxford University. So this slide very quickly talks about how we developed our relationship with Oxford. Um, the luck was that I, I read the right subject there for my undergrad degree. I, I read biology. And when the cannabis market was opening globally in 2015, I went to see my old biology professor for the concept of um, starting and designing a cannabis research program with Oxford. He was a plant scientist specialist and was open to it and introduced us um, to various members of the Oxford medical sciences uh, community. Um, that led to nearly one and a half years worth of discussions with the university and culminated in us signing a research agreement uh, with Oxford um, for a series of cannabis research projects. Um, we think it's quite a unique agreement. Um, it took us nearly one and a half years. So any other cannabis company that's looking to do similar wouldn't be able to do it with Oxford because they work with us, but it would take a similar amount of time to do it with another university of similar caliber. We also own all of the IP that is produced as a result of the research. So I think it's a, a really useful partnership for OCT. It stands us in 
excellent stead, both in the near term and also um, in the years ahead. Um, and I think it's a real differentiator for, for us as a business. John. Let's talk about our pipeline. We have a well differentiated pipeline that will not collapse in the event of a drug failure. And this offers significant downside protection. Uh, obviously more important is the upside of the pipeline. Let's start with the first candidate, OCT461201. This is a cannabinoid mimetic developed by a spin out of Pfizer. The compound is a highly potent and selective CB2 agonist and has no psychoactive properties. It's going to be a first in class compound for neuropathic pain and neuroinflammation. The first indication we're pursuing is post herpetic neuralgia, a pain condition arising from shingles. We're pursuing a post herpetic neuralgia because of the homogeneous nature of the patient population, and this reduces the risk associated with pain trials. The second indication is for visceral pain associated with irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS. The compound is in preclinical development. It's already demonstrated uh, efficacy in three in vivo pain models and safety in two animal species, rats and dogs. We're developing uh, a, a 46-1201 as a pill, solid oral dosage form, and aim to be in phase one clinical trials in Q3 of 2022 and advancing to phase two clinical trials in Q2 of 2023. Our second program, GXC number two, PCB stands for phytocannabinoids. Uh, it's a combination of, of phytocannabinoids and we're, because we're using phytocannabinoids, we don't expect any safety issues. Uh, we're pursuing orphan indications to obtain market exclusivity. The first indication for this drug candidate is a pain condition that causes sudden excruciating pain. The drug product will be administered to the lungs to decrease onset time and uh, reduce liver metabolism. And again, we aim to be in phase one in Q3 of 2022 and advancing to phase two clinical trials in Q2 of 2023. Our third program, I'll briefly go over three and four. Our third program will screen and identify a compound from our proprietary library that is active in neuropathic pain model. And we aim to be ready for preclinical development in Q3 of 2020, Q2, excuse me, of 2023. And finally, our fourth program is a program that will identify a first-in-class drug candidate targeting, uh, at this point, it's an undisclosed cannabinoid receptor. Uh, it's undisclosed for um, commercial reasons. The drug candidate is going to have broad use in pain, inflammation, epilepsy, and cancer. If we take a look at timelines, we expect our first drug approvals and commercialization to occur in 2027. And this will be uh, followed soon thereafter by subsequent approvals. A key synergy of our product strategy is that we select drug candidates that can be repurposed across multiple indications. This adds significant value to the drug candidate because by doing so, we do not have to repeat the early stages in development uh, for these subsequent indications. We also have a timeline for news flow. We'll be making regular announcements to the market to update investors on the status of our program. The total addressable market is made up of those pain segments that cannabinoids can address as shown on slide nine uh, it was, that I showed earlier. Initially, we're pursuing two of these segments, neuropathic pain and visceral pain, which make up the serviceable available market. The serviceable obtainable market refers to those indications that we're pursuing currently. The 1.55 billion SOM represents only two of the candidates and three indications. Uh, we're being conservative with that. This number uh, will increase, obviously, as we add new indications and new drug candidates. I'll end this presentation with a question for you. The next time you take a medicine or you administer one to your child or loved one, I want you to ask yourself, do I care whether this has gone through the rigors of clinical testing and is regulated by a medicines regulatory agency like MHRA? Your answer will explain why OCT is here. Uh, we, Neil and I, hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. 